nossos terminais no coffee também, tem um coffee bom, mas o coffee de graça também fica lá dentro, mas ainda lá vai ficar disponível para todo mundo. Eu vou falar um negócio rápido, tá? A hora que acabar aqui a palestra, é, ontem foi aniversário do Joey, a gente vai cantar um, um parabéns, tá? Só a gente tá sabendo que ele não vai entender. É isso. Então, pessoal... Hey, Joey, now it's your time. É... A clap of hands for Joey. Yeah. Hola, Pan Luigi. Beleza, right? <laughs> so, I'm running out of Portuguese words. Uh, Valeo, okay. <laughs> Legal. Okay, so I want to talk about. Uh, They are, first of all, it's very good to be here again. I always enjoy coming to uh, Paxiguru here in Sampa. And uh, I've even got Sampa right anyway, so I've been coming enough. And actually, when you look at that timeline, I've been involved with Paxiguru since about 2014. So I've been doing uh, you know, a little bit of collaboration here and there, and, but it's been growing uh, through the last years. And here I want to talk about uh, a big thing that I'm concerned about is always not originally I used to think uh, some of you might know Diego Olivier that uh, works in operations or some other areas now uh, originally me and Diego were brainstorming a few years ago about a cool topic to, to kind of get together and kind of share knowledge about it it was deliver fast with confidence but the more I started looking at delivering fast with confidence I realized it's not about going fast Sometimes you can go real fast, but you're not going the right direction. And it was really more about delivering value uh, with, with, with confidence. And, and one of the complaints that, that I've had throughout the years is, especially at the agile, most of the big agile conferences, especially in the US, less so here in Brazil, Brazil still keeps some of the tech, technical people and developers with, Agile, but if you go to the US, almost everything now is mostly the big one is mostly management and just more on the people skills or other stuff. But originally, it was you know, they were supposed to bridge the gap between the two. We're not supposed to be in us and them. And in fact, in the, con the conference in the US, they even created a, a tech conference for them, and it's almost like pulling them away. And that was never really what the uh, initial ideas were behind this. So, I want to talk about that today and talk about ways how it, the developers are an important part of the value stream. And in fact, development decisions that we make uh, are, uh, and technology decisions really can influence the how agile you are. And then in fact, here at Paxiguru, they have some very good examples where some technology decisions definitely helped enable them to be more lean and agile and continue some of the fantastic growth that's happened through the past four to five years, right? And it's still continuing on. Short disclaimer, you know, hey, these are my ideas. Even though I might occasionally mention Paxiguru or other people, if you like them, fine, you can give Paxiguru credit, but if you don't like them, don't hold them responsible or any other organization I happen to mention. You know, and plus, I, uh, I like to remain teachable and always continue to grow. And so I have the right to change my mind, right? And maybe you teach me tonight through some of this stuff. And, and uh, so don't, don't hold me that perpetually that, oh, Joe said this yesterday. And then maybe I learned something new that that's part of uh, evolution. So I, I want to go with that. So there's so many agile lean processes out there, right? I mean, I don't know how many people here are doing uh, Kanban. Anybody doing Kanban? Many. Anybody doing Scrum? A few people doing Scrum-like stuff. Uh, TDD. Okay. BDD. Okay. Some a couple people. Uh, you know, and you have so so there's so many of these for mob programming. Anybody doing XP? A few people. In fact, I've done a little mobbing with some of the, the USB people before. That, that was always, that was fun. So I'd do it again. Uh, don't, 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 don't tell the, uh, the, the, the boss back there, but I do it for free, right? So, <laughs> I, I like mobbing with a lot of, 
you know, the uh, people that lo love that. And there's just something about that environment. But the, the thing about, uh, with Agile, I mean, what I, a lot of times there's all this view of Agile. It depends on who you talk to. What is Agile? Oh, Agile is if you scrum. Well, if you have these two-week sprints and you do stand-ups like this and, and you time box things well and stuff like this, you're being Agile. But sometimes people get so fixed on that that they're becoming rigid and it's almost anti-agile. Scrum itself is never, is not agile itself. It's a process that you can use. You can use it while you're being agile, but Scrum doesn't make you agile. You know, but a lot of it is we're trying to get a vision. We, we create some kind of roadmap. Um, we're, we're getting feedback. Obviously, they're looking at things like task burn down or your story. What's our release burn up? What's our velocity? Uh, that management always seems to like velocity. How fast are we going? Uh, which isn't necessarily a good measure of how much value are we adding, but you know that's something that's looked a lot uh, with that. But one of the things when I always look at uh, uh, Joe is you have this concept of inspecting and adapting and constantly learning. Uh, and one of the things that a lot of the with the Agile mindset is we're not going to we're going to try a lot of little experiments. If, if they don't work, we learn from them. And, and as I, sometimes people say fail early and learn. As long as you learn, it's not a failure. Sometimes the word failure gets mistaken. So we're trying, to, uh, Pax the Guru is always trying a lot of little experiments and some of them take off and go viral, then that's a win. So you try 10 of them and one's good and, it, and the other one weren't, but they, we were experimenting. And, and that's part of trying things. And, and, but that's not only with different products that we do. But even teams can get into that mindset. We want to experiment with the way our team's working. Uh, let, let's try a little bit of swarming or mobbing and things and, and see if that helps the team. Or let's try some different types of practices. And let's take away the con. I, I have one friend in Japan, what he likes to do is sometimes take away the Kanban board from the team for, for a few days. And then they find out what was really valuable with, with that Kanban board. And then that, because there might be waste going on. It could be we're so stuck and it steps us out of our comfort zone to, to really kind of try new things. Uh, and, and in fact, be, because of the way Agile is, there's a lot of these myths. Uh, me and some colleagues have written up on agilemyths.com. If you go to agilemyths.com, we put a few of them up there. And feel free to email me more if you, if you want to put some up there. But uh, well, one of the big ones is, I don't know if people know, know what KISS is. Anybody know what KISS is? What is it? Stupid, yeah, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, so it's not like a mwah, like kiss. It might be like the uh, kiss of death, right? If you're not, keep it simple. And, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of times, because even like Kent Beck with XP is just do the simplest thing possible. You know, and that was even before the Agile Manifesto with extreme programming. And one of the issues with that is the simplest thing possible varies. The simplest thing for Kent Beck could be very complicated for me, maybe, because you know he has so much knowledge and experience on doing some things, and so that's a big variance. And sometimes a simple solution isn't always the best for the business problem that you're solving. And so sometimes it is. We we try not to add complexity where we don't need, and we don't need to add uh, in, in any uh, additional complexity to the system, uh, in accidental complexity to the system. But sometimes simple isn't the best. Also, people get lured into, ooh, we can just always deliver really fast. We're going to have very reliable stuff. Agile will help us continue to just always go fast. And people get caught up with doing whatever their favorite Agile process is, your iterative process, whether it's Scrum or Kanban or whatever. And at first, you know, we're working with product managers or product owners or whatever, and we have the Agile team, and boy, we're delivering features pretty quickly. Uh, but then all of a sudden some new feature comes along, maybe after six months or a year or two years down the road, that looks like something we did last year. And then we're like, oh, this feature, even though it looks like that, now that we have all this extra complexity, it's going to take three times the amount of work. Uh, you know, the system's starting to become muddy, or maybe security now, and scalability is an issue. You're regulated, money's involved, so we have to be careful. So uh, it, it's not that, you, it, sometimes it's not always about going fast. 
And also, well, if we just magically fo follow some kind of nice little process, of some well-known agile process, we'll be able to, you know, the architecture will magically emerge. Don't worry about qualities. Don't worry about security or reliability or performance. Wait till the last responsible moment, which unfortunately sometimes gets translated in the uh, people out there doing things is the last possible moment. And so we have a lot of good engineers. Paxaguru has a lot of good engineers. All, all over the world there's many good engineers. It is the last possible moment. Sometimes we're good at making it work, but it, can, it puts a lot of complexity in the system and sometimes we have to tear it up. You're throwing security in a cross-cutting concern at the last possible. That's why one thing we've, uh, me and a, a colleague of mine, Rebecca Wurzbrock, we've always pushed the most responsible moment. So there might have been a more responsible moment, even though you could have put it off and still made it work, it was painful, uh, there might have been a more responsible. And if you want to have good architecture, it's, it's still, uh, Agile never said that we couldn't think about architecture. That was never in the Agile Manifesto or the 12 Principles of Agile, whatever that means, right? It, it, is it still okay to, we're not supposed to commit a lobotomy and just do whatever and just blindly follow whatever, do the uh, simplest thing that works. Sometimes that's what we want to do, but sometimes we need to kind of step back and think carefully and do something better. So I've been wanting to, to, to challenge this and, and see one of the problems is in the Agile world is that there's these different teams and roles. And uh, originally we, we, we were trying to, you know, the, we've always had roles in software development, but with Agile usually there's something like product owners or product managers, some, something of that type of role. There's usually some kind of Agile master, maybe they're called scrum masters, depending upon your organization and what you're doing. Uh, obviously we have team members. So what is a team member? What could they be? What could be a team member? Engineers? Engineers? QAs? QAs. QAs. Designers. What else? Designers? Could be GUI designers, right? Yeah, so you could have all those types of people. And there may even be other ones, such as maybe occasionally your organization may have coaches to try to stir stuff up, keep the masters from getting too comfortable or, or look at things. You might have directors, tech leads. Uh, so the team members can include a lot. Unfortunately, a lot of times, especially from, from some of your software engineers, they're, even though they're a team member, sometimes it's like, well, how do I fit into this nowadays? Wow, if I really want to get ahead, boy, the PO gets to decide when the decisions are made, the order of stuff. If I want to get ahead in my career, even though I like to, to hack, I like to write a lot of good quality code, but the, the Agile masters are getting all the, you know, they, they get all the cool stuff. Maybe I need to change, you know, uh, am I really, I don't even, even though I'm supposedly part of, sometimes there's this disconnect. You know, just like I even said at some of the, some of the Agile conferences, th th there's, uh, the, the, there's not as much emphasis anymore as there used to be. And, and so how can we, uh, and so I've been really trying to, originally that was not supposed to be the case. Originally, when, when the Agile Manifesto was done in 2000, and, and uh, all, all the people that were part of that Agile Manifesto, you, you, you had people like Kent Beck, you had Martin Fowler, uh, you had Alistair Kohlberg. I mean, you had some very technical people that, that were really involved in bridging the gap, and we need to do a better job than the old analysis paralysis. And the development with the business, tightly coupled together, constantly, it's not an us and them, it's us, it's we. We are all working together in how to do that. And it was really, let's tear down the wall. Uh, but unfortunately, it seems like through time, uh, good or bad, I mean, Agile's done a lot of good things on one hand, but on, you know, and it's, it's, it definitely uh, helped with a lot of testing and, and getting this more of this short iterative process. But on the other hand, sometimes, especially like if you want to be Agile, just buy my framework, buy my tools, and, you will, and follow this process, and you will be Agile. You, you have a lot of uh, people selling snake oil skin, so to speak, is if you want to be Agile, buy buy this for me and I'll make you agile. Here, just do this, your daily stand-ups like this, you know, and, and enter your information and have the right charts like this. But, but that doesn't make us agile. In, in fact, you can be very rigid doing that and, and it's even kind of taking the emphasis away from uh, what, what the original goal was behind that. So how can we build this, you know, I, I, I have, 
I have a passion for rebuilding, reconnecting, because this is what Agile was all about, is building the, the bridge between this, not the separation. Um, and, and yeah, there's value on both sides. I mean, developers and, and, and technical people need to support the business, and you have to look at the business values, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a close relationship. Technology decisions are very important for the business. And so if the business just thinks, oh, don't worry about the technology or whatever, well, sometimes all of a sudden the business finds it's not so lean and agile, they got a ball of mud, or even, I mean, Paxaguru did many beautiful things with the monolith for years, and that got them to where they were to start off. But if they would have continued down that path, there's no way they can be where they're at today. So some of those technical decisions were key to, to <laughs> help sustain the, the agility of what's going on. So a big thing I'm making here is values drive practice. So this is a good friend of mine, Richard Gabriel, who uh, he's actually been down here to Brazil uh, at least once or twice, uh, I think a couple times with me. And the, uh, he, he's a big, he actually he, he's pretty well known computer scientist as well for some people. If you Google him, you can find a lot out there about him. But uh, he wrote the, the paper a long time ago, which is probably the first open source argument before open source, I mean talking in the early 90s, called Worse is Better. And it talked about, because he came from the Lisp uh, functional world back before it was, it's popular again like it is now, right? With Kotlin or Clojure or all the other functional, it's kind of made a, a comeback. Um, but he talks about why sometimes Worse wins. And we even saw that with Microsoft, Microsoft over Macintosh in the late 80s and early 90s with, with a lot of stuff that went on with that. And a lot, so there's, there's some quality about being good enough, but he's also a musician, and he's also a poet. 20 years ago, he decided to go back and get his MFA in poetry. He's also a PhD in computer science, ran his own business. Very interesting character, cool, cool guy to know. He's done many, many interesting things. But he'll tell you, for the last 20 some years, he's wrote a poem a day, no matter what. Why? And he'll tell you most of his poems suck. In fact, he even wrote a DSL, a functional programming language for generating haikus. And it actually, uh, it, and he took all the haikus it generated and took it to a writer's conference, and it, it, the writers thought, ooh, it was amazing until they found a computer program generated it. <laughs> now, he had put a lot of his AI, I mean, because it, it was doing some machine learning and other stuff, and it was a DSL for doing that. But he, the reason he'll tell you he writes a poem a day is because he values it. And it values, and he says, that's how I get better. And, and just like a chef, I have a friend that's a master chef. He, he, now he, you know, he no longer lives close to me, which was cool when he did, because I could always, hey, let's do dinner at your house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'll do the dishes. But I mean, part of the process is he's always experimenting with new things. And as part of a chef or a musician, they're always trying different things. I like to dance, and actually, tomorrow night, I might go out and, do, and learn some for all, you know? And try the formal, I have Joe's way of dancing. Whatever that is, I can always do the sock or whatever. <laughs> I was actually dancing at Scrum Rio, having fun with some people here, actually from Paxaguru. It was it was fun, but but you know, since I value it and like it, it should drive my practices. <coughs> so Paxaguru has Paxaguru values. I'm just going to use Paxaguru as an example, but they have many teams, over 150 now. Four or five years ago, when I was here, they only had 20. So that's tremendous growth. A good thing, but it's challenging. Sharing knowledge now, nobody can understand the architecture anymore. Used to be I could pick the three or four people that could know the architecture, but nobody does. It's taken a life of its own. A good thing, but you have to be careful, c careful with that. So as things, as things have evolved over time uh, with that, is what, what, are the, what are the values of Paxaguru? What are the t team's values? Or digital payments. Digital payments has quite a few teams, right? How, how many teams are in digital payment now? Is it 10, 20 teams in digital payments? Maybe 20. 20, 20 maybe up to 20 now. And you have some that are even in a different, uh, Agraricora maybe, or Uberlandia, right? There's some yes. teams maybe doing. So there, there needs to be some kind of shared values with digital payment, and I think they even have a little bit of a document page that shares some of their best, which is pretty well done. But then even teams have values, and I have my own values, so those were dry practices. So what do we value? So when we think about agile developers, so I'm a developer and I'm, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an agile developer, what are my values? What are some of the things that connect me with agile and software development? 
Well, one that I that I believe in is sustainable development. I want to be able to sustain this, not get hit a brick wall and we can no longer grow things. I don't want a ball of mud. I want to have something uh, that, that we can evolve and, and I get a new requirement from the, the business side and the PO and, we, and I feel comfortable that I've added the new feature without breaking anything and, and I'm adding value and, and it's meeting things. So sustainable development is one. Now how about, how about heroes? Should we have superheroes? Is that, is that an agile value? Nah, you're right. Thank you. I'm glad you said no. And this is one of the problems. Sometimes people, you, you know, maybe we have Tatiana is always the one rescuing us all the time. And, and, but all of a sudden she's gone on vacation. We're in trouble. Or she gets sick or maybe she decides she has to move on with her career. Uh, so agile values is, is more like a team sport. So even though you have some stars on the team, it's still, the team can, you know, it's all of us working together. It's not one individual saving us and putting out the fires. If we're having, putting out fires all the time, that's a problem. And, and uh, this is a big principle. I always look at doing good quality, quality software, or help ensuring that we're meeting the requirements. You know, and even our delivery, what we're, what we're pushing out there to, to different people is, is we're confident about what we're deploying reliably and we're building into that feedback loop and we're testing and automating what we have. And we're really ensuring that not only we're meeting the functional requirements, but maybe there's other things like performance or reliability or security and things. So these are good values for, agile, for, for technical engineer values. And also I believe we have value in monitoring and learning and making sure what we're doing is right. Making it visible, but also making it visible to the business side so that good business decisions can be made with that. And so I look at all these as important values as a developer, you know, from the, techni the technical team. And, and this adds a lot to the value stream for the business. And so if we focus on that, so I want to spend a little bit of time at least talking about a few of these and, and thinking about it. So obviously continuous delivery, whatever that means, uh, has grown tremendously, especially since microservices. And then it, 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 as you use it in DevOps. But you can, you can use continuous deployment delivery type ideas, whatever. Uh, you know, I don't like the word continuous so much because that, it, I come from a mathematical background. That has, but, but really it's kind of some regular type releases, delivery, keeping things working, these types of stuff. But the nice thing is this fits in well behind the first principle of the Agile Manifesto. So when a team is good at this, it says our highest priority is satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. That's our first principle. This was written uh, more than 15 years ago, right? Close to 17 or 18 years ago when, when they did the 12 principles, whenever, whenever that was, right? And so DevOps and some of this other fits in well to that. Uh, so sometimes so, some organizations are better at doing this than others, but uh, this, this is a key win. Fortunately, you're, uh, a lot of organizations, if they're really going to succeed with microservices, this is a must. And you're able to get some of that if you want to be successful as having a good pipeline and a quality pipeline. Not a lot of manual things. You try to minimize the manual things. The bare minimum you need, like it for a quality pipeline, is obviously you're setting, building things maybe running unit tests or some other kind of lint checkers or whatever you need to do for qualities. And then obviously you need to do some kind of stage, stage testing and some kind of staging area and ultimately deploy. To me, this isn't even quite good enough. I still want things like stage releases, blue-green deployment, code quality, health checks. There's all kinds of things you can put in your pipeline. This is a minimum. I know I've worked with some teams here in Paxaguru where uh, we kind of created a minimum and now, in fact, it's grown so much, and now, you know, they have many more teams that they're going to be growing in the next year, it sounds like, because of your, your continued success, way to go, congratulations, it is uh, having kind of a, uh, Pax Guru needs, I hate to use the word governance, but that's, you have to have a little bit of that. So maybe guidelines, the G word for government could be within the Pax Guru guidelines, I have to stay at least within this framework, Here's the minimum pipeline that ensures a certain quality if I'm on a team or some squad with inside Paxaguru doing something. 
I need some base minimum of what that is. And, and so, at, and so like I said, this is bare minimum, but I, in my opinion, and mo most pipelines that I've seen inside Paxico are much better than this. But this is the bare minimum if you want to, to do things. Also, automation is key. And I love this quote by Bill Gates, and for those of you that can't see it, I'll read it to you. But it says, the first rule of any technology used in a business is that automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. The second rule, is what he's saying, is that automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. And how powerful is that? And that's so true. And how often do we resist automating? And that's why one of the, one of the patterns that I've that I written up recently for being agile at quality is automate as you go. Uh, I tried to translate this to Portuguese. Uh, automatize the seam cu puder, pude. <laughs> okay, I need more help. <laughs> Duol Duolingo to the rescue. <laughs> but, but, uh, but this is so true. It can really help us, especially if we, we're repeating. So there's some things that we should automate, repetitive tasks. If there if there's a, involves waiting, error prone or tedious. Uh, I mean, some things might be so expensive to automate, you only do it once, why do it? But if it's a repetitive task or it has high risk and we want to ensure a certain quality and then we can repeat it, that way I make sure a problem doesn't come back for the company. It could be that maybe some calculation was wrong that cost the company uh, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand rei or a million rei in just an hour of time or whatever. We want to make sure that problem never comes back. So let's write some good tests and automate it. Or maybe there was some practice that we had. So applying these types of principles can help. Now obviously quality, I, this was one of the things I had on the values of, uh, these are at least what I have as my values for uh, the agile developer. You know, and I'm always welcome for other people's values, you know, when we have a little bit later here. But obviously uh, most, time we're looking at the non-functional requirements, some people call them, the illities, the qualities. Uh, and, and you always hear about security, scalability. In English, they always end up with this, usually this illity. Not always performance does it, but, you know, reliability, availability. But there's some qualities that are key to success, to sustaining things. And for example, development velocity, sustainability, and confidence there's some important qualities that can really make a big difference, such as maintainability, how easy it is to add a new feature. Maybe I should design thinking how to test it. Uh, in fact, uh, one, one of my colleagues I work with, Eduardo Guerra, um, we, we wrote a bunch of TDD patterns, but we talked about you can design thinking about how to test it. That can really help. Or deployability, you know, making it easier to deploy. Uh, and the, these, it, it, it's been shown that these are very important principles, very important entities, but most of the time, okay, the functional requirements are always looked at by the business and PO. They're the most, then they're important. These they look at because we have to. Okay, it's mandated by law that we have to be secure, you know, you, you're regulated. And you, you, you have, you know, you did an IPO and you have SACS requirements or whatever. Um, availability. It, the customer gets very unhappy and we lose business. But these, a lot of times, the, the technical people really need to provide feedback to the company because this really can help. We can go fast for the short term, but if we're not addressing these in the short term, it's almost like too much technical debt. Sometimes you make a business decision to incur some debt, just like if I'm getting a, if I, I know Paxaguru is in the financial area and even maybe with loans now, so sometimes a loan is good, it helps you buy something I couldn't have bought and I needed, but I need to pay it back. And, and if you have bad debt, like some banks in the U.S. did about 10 years ago, <laughs> it was a serious problem, right? And you have serious, same way with our systems. If we don't pay back some of that debt, there are serious consequences. And so in the short term, it's just like when people were given money that couldn't pay for the house, you know, they, they had, woohoo, everything's happy, right? <laughs> to all of a sudden, six months or one year later, and then all of a sudden, the, the, that all fell through, and then they were grading these as triple, uh, you know, triple A credit debts, or, uh, but in reality, these people didn't have the money to pay it back, and so they were buying things they couldn't afford, and then all of a sudden, well, we had the big closures, and, you know, that caused a lot of issues. 
with that. Yeah. Same way with our systems. And so we get, the analogy works well. And, and uh, this was a, actually, uh, this is a technical debt is a, a term coined by a good colleague, a friend of mine, Ward Cunningham. And I, I don't know if everybody here has heard of Ward Cunningham, but probably some people haven't. This is one of my favorite dudes, best hack, one of the best hackers I've ever known. How many people here has heard of Wiki? The Wikipedia, stuff like that? He invented it. He invented the Wiki. And, and the word Wiki is a Hawaiian word for fast moving. And it was done in the early 90s for, when you're really, it was a pattern a collaborative tool. So the web had just come out. And so let's, he wrote this kind of cool tool real quick, like overnight in a couple days or whatever, so that we had this nice collaborative tool, you know, and then it, the wiki took a life of its own, and obviously many things have happened in blogs and Wikipedia, but, uh, and, and he actually, he worked a lot with Kickback, they, they, they did a lot of extreme programming type stuff, even in the 80s and stuff with small talk, but very smart guy, but he talks about technical debt as something if we don't pay attention to, and so business needs to pay attention to it, uh, and it's very important, if, if we put this off too long, you end up with a monolith, right? A, 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 big, a big ball of mud or something like that. In fact, that's one of the reasons that Paxiguru brought me in originally about five years ago is because they have a ball of mud monolith and how to evolve it. And, and you know, and, and we could have, we, we could write a lot of automated tools for refactoring it that we're really good at that. I come from the refactory and really good at transforming it to something better, but it was more than that. You have to change the mindset, because if you clean it up and everybody keeps doing the same thing, six months or a year later, you have something just as bad, if not worse. So then you wasted all your time, and you really needed to change the way prioritization was being done, the agile mindset that was going on, and also the way you manage technical debt. So sometimes we're learning, so you incur a little bit of accidental complexity. There's nothing wrong with that. And when Ward Cunningham coined the term technical debt about 15 years ago, he talked about that. You know, it's not a bad thing to, 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 to have some of that. Or actually, it's about 20 years ago when he coined the term. It was in the 90s and, and not, not, not in the 2000s. But, but, so this term has been around a long time. But the, the problem happens, just like any kind of debt, is if you don't learn from it and then pay back some of it, the long-term consequences can be devastating. Sometimes debt is based upon sheer neglect or merciless deadlines. Deliver, 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 deliver. And we, we do well for a while, and then we hit a brick wall, and then they want us to deliver, and we're trying to, we're trying to, uh, most engineers I know want to keep the customer happy and they like delivering cool things. But if we're not managing this, it can cause serious consequences. And what's related to that is you have things like quality debt and test debt. In fact, this has been around for a while. Uh, this is actually, well, there we have one of the attendees' pictures on here, that's Professor Goldman, but uh, Graziella did her PhD uh, last year with this and did some very interesting work, but she talks about how to not only find evidence of the debt and, and look at the impact for measuring it and making it visible, but how to make business decisions based upon that. And it's key to tie into business value, because some debt, for example, part of the monolith is still adding value, but it's never changing. And maybe you wrap it up so it looks like you're talking to a microservice. Well, that's fine. If it's not changing, why it is too tightly entangled to pull out on its own? It's too, you know, why, why waste time in it? But if you have a lot of pain and you're constantly changing things, and so trying to prioritize that is really good. And actually, uh, you, you, you can talk to uh, Professor Goldman back there, Alfredo, the... Uh, and he can actually, and Grazi Seats is available as well. But, and we've actually had her here at Paxaguru before, and, and uh, she, she loves talking about the, this type of material. So we can actually, uh, anybody interested, I'm, I'm gonna try to be more proactive. One of the things is, you wanna make sure that some of the practices that were done in the monolith are, are not being done in microservices. But if you don't monitor it and keep track of it and make it visible to the team, uh, it doesn't happen. Just like me, I'm trying to lose weight now, okay? I'm, gonna, I'm definitely overweight, right? And so I'm trying to experiment. Well, I need to make it visible, so I, you know, I'm checking out, I'm trying to do a low-carb diet. It's an experiment, because I've had some friends that's had good luck with it, and I could still eat a lot of good food. But <laughs> I couldn't eat a lot of this food, but there were some, it was all delicious, I love it all. 
but I was real careful with my low carb uh, diet, and I'm, which in Brazil is very challenging. I've been here two weeks because <laughs> you have so much wonderful pounded queijo and all the fruits and coxinha and all the other. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to Minas Gerais to Agile Brazil and Belo Horizonte. Um, this Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I'm going to have a carb day, right? So <laughs> it's okay. But but I, the main thing here is if I don't make it visible and be careful and watch what I'm doing and measure it and make sure I'm doing the right thing, so you know, so I, I, I'm watching the carbs, I'm keeping track of the carbs, and, I, and I'm also looking at the, uh, the uh, I check my weight before I came here, now I'm going to check it after I go back, so this will be a good experiment here. I'm traveling in Brazil, and how good did I do, and things like that. So far, okay. You know, though yesterday it was my birthday, and uh, uh, a friend of mine surprised me with a birthday cake. Well, I didn't eat the whole, I made, I made her and her guy eat the cake, but I had a little taste, uh, so I couldn't resist, so it was good. Yeah, that was actually Grazi who brought that by, so, because they're actually, uh, they live a couple blocks from where my hotel was, so, that, so thank you, Grazi. <laughs> <laughs> Testing is key, and in fact, one thing that I really liked about, uh, we invented the term refactoring, not refactoring itself, but the term was the group I came from, with Professor Ralph Johnson, and we did the first commercial refactoring tools in the early to mid 90s, and did some of the first PhDs on refactoring. And one thing that refactoring, that was a key principle of refactoring, was testing. So if we're gonna restructure and try to make the, keep code clean, you have to be able to validate you didn't break anything. And so uh, testing frameworks evolved from that. One thing Martin Fowler did when he wrote the book, is first of all, Martin Fowler's a great author and a good communicator, and he was able to really get a lot of people on board around the world that refactoring's good. The reword, a lot of time, re, what do you mean, like rework? No, it's to add the new feature, we need to structure a little bit so we can add the new feature without making it too hard to add further features. And, and they really made testing part of that, and then extreme programming and TDD, which evolved from that. Then in the early Agile days, testing, uh, Agile really made testing important. It's not only the responsibility of QA, it's important to automate. It's also responsibility. Quality is a responsibility of all of us, from the business person, the product owner, to the uh, scrum master, agile master, to the developer, everybody. I, it's not like I just write some code and throw it over. You're the, you're the QA here. Now it's your responsibility, and you tell me where I'm wrong. No, it's a collaborative effort. Let's try to work together. Sometimes QA are embedded in agile teams for doing that. So, Testing is cool, and in fact, you'll get Kent back thumbs up yeah, with, with that. Now, how can, this is a quote I've been using a lot, how can I improve what, uh, what I cannot see? In other words, if I don't make things visible, and, and it's, it's good to have a lot of monitoring of what's going on, and, and this is something I'd, I'd encourage any organization, and even inside Paxiguru, to make this more visible of what's going on. And just like I, I use the example of me for losing weight, I, I can't improve unless I'm checking out, did this work or not? So, so being able to add that, it, it, so having information radiators, uh, without this timely information, we can't learn, and it can cause a lot of problems with the organization. So, so collaborative, the only way that this works is if the team values it. I can come here and say, ooh, you should have all these cool sonar things or continuous inspection all these nice charts, but if the team doesn't value it, it just becomes noise, you know, and pretty soon nobody's even paying attention. So the team has to collaboratively figure out physical artifacts. Sometimes they're digital, sometimes they're not. You, you don't always need digital. Some of the best are the, the you know, the non-digital, the physical artifacts for that the information's available to all stakeholders. And that fits into the agile mindset, you know, is transparency, trust, building things in well. And in fact, this is one of the patterns we wrote. This book actually just got published and you can actually buy it online. You can buy a digital version here. I think you can also buy the print version either here or through Amazon if you want. But there's 90 some patterns. And some of it we talk about how to organize teams, but also how to focus on your value stream. But one of them is making things visible. You know, and uh, so and having a lot of radiators around. Uh, I, I went to, um, I became good friends with Woody Zoll. I don't know if anybody heard of Woody Zoll. By the way, Woody Zoll is giving a keynote, the first opening keynote in Agile Brazil this Wednesday. So I'll put a plug in for him. 
But what he saw about five years ago was writing a, an experience report paper at the main Agile conference in the US called Mob Programming. Because Mob Programming was just kind of coming up at that point. And I like, well, that sounds cool. I, I, and so part of the process that we use at the experience reports is we want to help the authors communicate clearly. So we do something that professional writers do. We do shepherding. I look at their paper, give them feedback, and stuff. So I said, I want to shepherd this. And so we became Skype buddies, you know. And so I spent a lot of time with them in Skype. What's your message? And his main thing wasn't like, you should do mob programming or you should do mob programming. It's like, you should continuously learn. And that's how they stumbled onto this and it provided a lot of value. All of a sudden, they were delivering up to 10 times the things with a lot fewer defects. And it was so successful that management really protected them. Now they have a big formal environment, went from one mob teams to like 10 mob teams, just continuously delivering a lot of value. But, but, a, lot, but a lot of that was based, you know, it, it is, is this continuous learning, making things visible and watching what's going on with that. And so with, uh, when, when you're making things visible, you have to think about who's your audience, right? Who are we trying to make things visible to? Uh, so, obviously, if I'm a developer, well, maybe the visibility is more than my IDE. There might be some other external <laughs> thing. But the team, the team may have a lot of different metrics that we can make visible. And so the correlation I'm making with Woody is when I became friends with Woody, I was actually over in Europe at, at a conference in, in Poland. I know I got a loud voice, so I almost don't need this, right? So anyway, he's telling me I should use it better. The, uh, <clears throat> thank you, saved my voice. The, uh, but when I was in Poland, at the same time, he was in Stockholm, Sweden. I said, Woody, we've become friends. Why don't I try, I have a friend in Stockholm. So I flew there and I met him and we went to H&M and we went to, they were doing a little bit of swarming or mobbing occasionally. And we went to Spotify. And one of the things I was impressed in Spotify is when I walked around, it, besides just being a cool organization with all their squads and the environment, the way they separated teams, you could imagine all the teams had kind of like their own area, but it was open because they had just put kind of webbing, big webbing where you could see through. But then they had their own space to kind of set up and decorate with all their radiate. The radiators were everywhere. So even the first there was these global radiators just walking between teams, making things visible. Ooh, there, there's one of the tweeting sessions. That's a set part of the code I'm working on right now. Everybody's complaining about. That, that can influence my mindset, you know, and help me Wow, I can fix that right now. And you know, and other things could be metrics as cross-team metrics. Some could be organizational metrics or the company metrics, what they want to make visible out to the outside world. So you, it's important to know our type of audiences will have different types of visibility depending upon what we want for values. And developers are a key part of this, especially when it comes to the team or cross-team type things that can add value with that. So I, for example, I think with the digital payments, there's a lot of teams, right? So there's probably some cross metrics. There are some experiments that you try, and if they add value, but it's important for the team members to own it. And, and these should constantly be updated and evolved, because otherwise we get stuck, and then they no longer add the value. Uh, that, that you know, that we, we can lose the value. And, and I already talked a little bit about mobbing, but swarming is where we can really, you don't always have to mob full time, but they, they do where they have, actually they have even more formal stations, but here's a mob team, a, a bunch of developers working around a single computer, constantly rotating, keeping things going, and then if I, if I need a break or, or she needs to go away and go have some meeting or do email, they can do all those types of things, but the team keeps going and keeps focused on adding value, constantly delivering value. Well, sometimes, even if you're not mobbing full time, like what I just said, there could be important problems that come up that we need two or three or four people to swarm together, multiple people work together on the work item, be it an issue, user story, or impediment. But we need more brain power. Sometimes I get stuck by myself on trying to do this, but a few of us, and so let's even work on the computer and rotate. They even have concepts of strong pairing, all other stuff. And then there's even some of these patterns that I wrote with for uh, Sugarloaf Plot last year, mostly Daniel, uh, he's been doing a lot of mobbing and he had evolved as an experience report, but I also work with Adamar who's been here before with helping with some of the scrum patterns and then my, my good friend Hiro from Japan. But sometimes when, even if you're swarming, sometimes there's some tasks that 
that's holding the team back that can be done by an individual so you can branch out and have that individual do it and come back to the swarm, to the mob team. Or sometimes there's a lot of repetitive tasks and we can, ooh, let's all split up together and do it and then come back and make sure we have the quality and integrate together. And we wrote a, we wrote a paper here at uh, the Sugarloaf Plop, which it got the name Sugarloaf, because our first one in 2001 was in Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> and then Sugarloaf, then it became a legacy. And we, most of those conferences, Plop conferences for in Latin American countries have been in Brazil, though we've had two outside of Brazil, one in Buenos Aires, it was the Tango edition, and then we had one last year where we wrote these patterns in Chile for the first time, and I think next year it'll be back in here in Brazil. Uh, originally we wanted to be it a lot, but the economies of some countries had problems in Brazil, helped sustain this uh, continuously. This is another way of doing visibility. So one of the things with mobbing is, the reason I put swarming is, I'll just back up, Many here, we were making things visible to a lot of people getting a lot of feedback. That's why I snuck this invisibility. Also, too, here is continuous inspection, which was a lot of open, especially if you're doing Java. Some in Kotlin, we've had some challenges in Kotlin. I'm trying to work with some teams here in Paxaguru doing some of that. But really, you can do a lot of continuous inspection and feedback. We wrote a paper here, which I'll gladly share if anybody sends me a message. Uh, or if you Google it, you can probably find it online. But it talks about really uh, how can we go through and analyze either, either static analysis or running software, giving feedback to the developer teams, which can also give feedback to architects or QAs or others. It could be the product owner. Uh, this could be the business decision makers. Whoops, sorry to help out. Went too fast there, hit the wrong button. So, uh, so this could be for a lot, a lot of different uh, people and there's some open source tools that help with, with a lot of this but it ties into the fact is let's constantly pay attention to what's going on and this is a good developer value and sometimes there's tools that we can automate that help us this is not a silver bullet and this fits into what I look at the agile lean core values of transparency obviously we want to be learning and make things visible sharing this is not mine this is our thing together that we, we have trust in teamwork and continuous improvement is key. And in fact, if there is a tech law backlog, it's important that it's part of the regular backlog and ties into the business value. It should be part of the business because you're making business decisions. Some technical debt, if it's not hurting us and it's not changing, even though I as a developer want to impress you and clean it up, uh, we don't have, you know, there's more important things that we can prioritize and only if it becomes painful and we're changing that, if that code's never changed in the last year or two, why would I want to clean it up and stuff? So, pause points help. <laughs> oh, I hit the pause button. Okay. Whoops. <laughs> so, if you really want to improve, it's important to take a little bit of time. So, I was saying a lot of words, so I was trying to give a pause point to you to, <laughs> you know, so if we, if we don't have time, you know, it's like, wow, we're, we're constantly in burnout mode, uh, all these tasks keep coming. Even if we find a way to reduce some tasks, what, what's the natural tendency for most teams? Just shift everything left. Don't even take advantage of all of a sudden. We, maybe we found a way to get some slack time. Uh, we, we found waste and we were able to retake a task that we thought was going to take uh, two days and we were able to do it in one day. And then rather than take advantage of some of that and ensure qualities and experiment, can maybe we find an order of magnitude w uh, way that we can do this much better. And a, a side effect is to go faster, but it should never be about going faster. It should be about learning and improving. And uh, it's, a, it, it's important to find. So what are some ways we can get slack time? Anything? What are some ways we can get slack time? Yeah, let's take a coffee or let's go out for ice cream. I was in Japan and we were doing some stuff and it's like, uh, we need an icebreaker. So we went out and got ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> ice cream makes for good. Uh, but sometimes you need to just step away from a problem. And then even when you're stepping away, maybe you're talking about something else and then all of a sudden, aha, and then you're able to come back because we're so stuck. Uh, or now we need to experiment. Monitor, first of all, you need to monitor and make visible what's going on. And then reduce waste, you know, the muda they say in Japanese, but 
for reduced waste, that gives us slack time. It's important to take advantage of it, and it, sometimes you want to inject time. So maybe you have a coding dojo, or you have a workshop, or you know you have different types of things in the day where this afternoon, this one Friday a month, or we're going to have a, a more of a fun, relaxed, creative day. Uh, that, that's one thing. I was impressed with one team inside Paxiguru, and my early days I was coming here, is what they did is every morning, this team decided on their own, is they're going through the day, they've created a lot of technical debt at nighttime. Uh, from the previous day, at nighttime, they can't clean it up because, you know, everybody's calling the PO saying, oh, we need to get this out, can, can we get this done? Or maybe, maybe uh, they have to go pick up the kids or they have, you know, a, a friend they have to meet, maybe boyfriend, girlfriend type thing. And uh, so at the end of the day, it was not a good time to try to deal with that. So what they did is when they come in every morning, before they've had their coffee, you know, or they're getting their coffee, they haven't done their stand-up yet, and so they, you know, there's at least an hour, a half hour or an hour before, it's almost like do, they would do almost like their morning stretches before they started, but their morning stretches was they cleaned up any technical debt they had from the day before. And that helped get your mind right, almost like if I'm gonna run, if I stretch, I'm gonna be able to run the marathon. You always stretch before you run a marathon, right? Yes, because uh, uh, actually uh, Professor Goldman back there runs a lot and he's run marathons. And if you don't, you're in trouble, right? So it's important to do that. So this is so cool, the team did it on themselves, the team here inside Paxiguru, is then, then when they had their daily stand up, it reminded them of any issues. And then also it helped influence them, their mindset through the rest of the day. So even simple things like that you can inject in. So the team injected a little bit of uh, slack time, you know, 30 minutes a day. One of the things with mob programming, they always do at the beginning of each day. They take one hour to learn about any new thing the team wants to. If you're really doing mob programming the way Woody talks about, Woody's all. And so with that, what they do is there could be some new tech, so they're taking five hours a week, one hour a day, let's learn about something new. Sometimes it might be related to work, but it could just be some new thing that might, that's how, in fact, when Google had that 20% thing one day a week. That's how Gmail came out. A lot of cool things came out of that from doing, uh, from having that little bit of injection of slack time. And so it, it's, and it's up to the team. The team gets to decide what they learn. It's not some agile coach saying, you, or some manager saying, oh, you need to learn about this, go research it. No, the team is, they have a passion for it. So they're out there really trying to, to mo they're motivated for about this. And then the team decides and prioritizes and have a way to decide that. And in fact, when you look at Spotify, Spotify, when they, their innovation model, they talk, they have this think it, build it, ship it, tweak it. You know, you're going through the product, minimal, minimal value product. I always say minimum awesome product, the map rather than MVP, you know, and they go through these different types of things. But if you really look at the Spotify model, if you continuously tweak it, you might do find a micro optimization, but sometimes you have to rethink it because there's another way much better way of doing everything or some kind of new product or whatever that we can think about. So stepping back and rethinking it is important. And that fits in well with that. And so this isn't me just saying slack time. I'm a big believer in it. Because if you try to stretch a spring too tight, what happens? If all of a sudden something bad happens, you have to stretch it more, it snaps, right? It breaks. And if you don't have a little bit of slack in your process, so even as we're putting things on the backlog for the next delivery, having some slack time, because if somebody gets sick, something goes wrong, new complexity, new, new requirement from the government comes in, we have a little bit of time to adjust and, and ensure quality. If we get done earlier, uh, one of our patterns in the Scrum Book is those that finish earlier, accelerate faster. Because you finish early, you're able to kind of work on things and find more creative, better ways to move faster. And also, this is a very famous author, too. They both won a lot of awards, Daniel Kahneman and also Tom DeMarker, but thinking fast and slow. There's value in both. Sometimes you, you need to think fast. So when you're doing TDD, red, green, red, green, red, green, failing test pass, new feature, failing test pass. Well, if you just keep doing that, you end up with a mess because there's a part of TDD that says slow down and refactor or sometimes step back and rethink it. And like if I'm crossing the street, you know, if I see a bus coming at me, my fast thinking can save my life. 
You know, as long as I don't freeze and I jump out of the way. But sometimes I need to think slowly and let's think of what the best route I needed to come here tonight, for example. And I was in Paulista Avenue one day by a big bookstore, and I happened to see that, wow, they were really promoting this book a few years ago. Uh, it, it is. So it's actually in Portuguese. I don't know how good the translation is. So just to wrap up, is when I look at Agile Lean, you're taking these different ideas, and we're building something, right? But what's key is, so we develop it, but we better be measuring and making visible and learning. Where we're taking data is important. So taking this data, and, and it shouldn't be, the teams can look at it. Sometimes you, you may not even know the patterns. That's where data science, there's some good data science teams, for example, going on here in this organization, and a lot of organizations are doing machine learning and data science, is you can learn from it. And not only is the things going on in the development team, not only within the code, but you can correlate what's going on with the code, but also with the teams, maybe there's a correlation, what makes for good productive teams. Maybe a team's having trouble because we haven't educated them well enough, or we haven't, maybe we need to, uh, maybe the senior person left and, and we need to get somebody else in. Uh, there could be all kinds of patterns. And so da data science or other things, the, I mean, we could look at the data and make an analysis ourselves, but sometimes there might be correlations we don't see that some machine learning might all of a sudden pop out. Oh, there's a pattern here. Does that mean anything to you? Uh, so learning is what's the most important long-term part of this. Data is not good or bad. Data is data. Data becomes bad if we use it as a weapon, right? And it's never meant to be that way. Data is data. Data is our friend. You're a technology company, so using data here is important. So to end up with them, I always like to talk about the agile mindset. Because there's a big difference between being agile and, and doing agile. A lot of times people blindly follow when you're doing agile, there's one truth, there's only one way to do things. And, and we can get stuck. And uh, we're really in being agile with the agile mindset, like Linda Rising, she's been down here a few times. Uh, get, she also did the fearless change patterns when you're trying to uh, fearlessly bring new changes into your organization and try to help really make your organization better. Uh, and I highly recommended her and Mary Lynn Manns. Marilyn Mans was the one that was dancing with me in that early picture, as the co-authors with, with that. And, and actually, if you Google Zumba and Sugarloaf Plot, you'll see in the towel, Mary Lynn, who is a Zumba instructor, leading a bunch of us doing Zumba dancing in, in the towel. It was a lot of fun. So, so I, when I think of being agile, you know, um, sometimes people say, oh, we don't need no stinking plan. No, don't worry about it. It'll work. Just, we'll just keep, we're, we're good. We're smart. But a lot of smart people, even doctors or people flying planes, I'm glad they have checklists and are carefully evaluating and thinking. Same way with us, we're doing some hard stuff. So, you know, we don't want a lot of upfront, but we want a rough adaptive plan that we're learning and evolving the right balance of design and architecture. And so this fits in well, and I want to kind of use a quote here from one of the, er the original signatures from the Agile Manifesto was Mike Beadle. Uh, unfortunately, he had a tragic thing happen last year where he was unfortunately murdered in Chicago. It was devastating with little kids. But one of his last quotes that he said, and I'll read it to you, he says, Agile does not cure incompetence. You know, is you can coach teams to be more engaged and collaborative, but no Agile framework, method, or mindset can save you from blatant failure if your development team is in incompetent in basic engineering practices. Technical excellence is a must. So if we're going to be successful, we really kind of need to bridge the gap between the people and the technical. This is important. It's, it's, it's us working together. Uh, and in fact, with Pax Guru, you see this example, because this is about how they used to release things every four, every, once a week they did releases, but every team could only release once a month. So one-fourth of the teams could release, could have the release one month. And they started off with just a few teams, not so bad, but when they hit 15 to 20 teams, they, they in fact, they wrote a, a, a paper, a mega framework that worked well, but it started reaching its limits with 20 some teams. And as Pax and Guru continued to grow, now with the microservices uh, and the other tech decisions, it helped them evolve more quickly. Here in one day, they this was last fall, I'm sure this number is much higher now, they had 157 different services had one delivery to protection, including new features, impossible before. So the technical decisions and things made really helped Paxiguru continue to evolve and stay very lean and agile and continue with this fast growth. If they had stayed with, you know, if they had not made good technical decisions as part of it, 
the prioritization was important, the people skills were important, it's all important. So you might have an agile elephant, but we want the agile cat, right? Before they kind of had the agile elephant, which got them success. The monolith was good to a point. A lot of times you shouldn't start off with microservices, but starting off with the monolith is good. And by the way, Paxiguru is not the only company. There's, there's been other companies that learned from Paxiguru, I think, or maybe the other way around. In other words, a lot of companies have been doing this. You know, here's just a few of uh, well-known companies. You, you could even say, even within Google, a lot of companies are, are these architectural decisions uh, have, have evolved. So it's a journey. It's not. It's a lot of baby steps to get there. Values drive practice. I started with that, so I want to end with that, right? So deal with technical debt, code quality, delivery size, and testing. That's important to make things visible with continuous improvement and learning. And uh, you know what you have part of? And developers are, agile developers are definitely an important part of the value stream and they should be valued within an organization, okay? So I don't know if I have time for any types of questions and what your values are, but I will say mutual, mutual regardo and uh, <laughs> You know, uh, thank you very much. And uh, so, that, and if you think good architecture is expensive, try bad architecture. That's one of our quotes from our big ball of mud paper. And if, any of you that know Marietta, this is a variation of a talk that uh, that, that I did at Scrum Rio this year. And Marietta motivated me here from Paxiguru to to kind of do a variation because she saw this even as an issue coming from an agile coach perspective. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>